into my heart, into my heart, into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today, come in to stay, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Holy God, let the word that you have for us today fall upon our hearts and open us to your presence. Amen. May every family in heaven and on earth gather in name and spirit. May God pour out courage and compassion on our congregation through the spirit. May our minds be open that Christ may dwell within. May our hearts receive the fullness of our faith. From generation to generation, God's grace is abundant. Amen.
we gather in this holy place that we might know and understand God better. Welcome, friends, all of you who are in the sanctuary. Welcome this morning, and a welcome to those of you who are worshiping with us online. We are glad to have you with us, and for those of you who are visiting with the first time, an especially warm and hearty greeting and welcome. Um, the membership uh, or registration pads, red pads for fellowship pads, I guess we call it, are on each aisle. And so if both the visitors as well as members would um, register your attendance so that we can greet each other by name uh, at the end of the service, that would be great. And for our visitors, there um, are blue fellowship um, folders for you to learn more about Bradley Hills. Pastor Davis is on sabbatical today, and um, those of you who might want to talk with him about exploring membership, please email him um, at david at bradleyhillschurch.org, and he will uh, respond to you to set up a time to do that at your convenience. So I'd uh, call your attention to the announcements in the bulletin, especially for our New Story Leadership alumni presentation this, morning, or this afternoon from 3 to 5 in Covenant Hall. So all are welcome to attend. Uh, we are looking forward to having a really robust presentation from some of our alumni, and these sessions have always proved to be just very dynamic conversations, and there will be a lot for us to talk about in light of what's happening in the world today. So again, Covenant Hall today from 3 to 5 p.m. There's uh, information for you about Vacation Bible School, which is from August 19th through the 23rd. For those of you who might be interested in helping to provide some supplies, there's a list of donations there. More information about youth confirmation, which will be this fall. Also, for um, many of you have expressed that you like to do hands-on ministry, so we have two opportunities for hands-on ministry. One is Becky's house, but um, coming up next month, I believe it is, Lon's house is a place where we have eight men um, that are housed in Rockville, and we have the opportunity to provide a meal for them as well as to stay in fellowship with them during the meal if you like. So please read that announcement in your bulletin if you'd be interested in having this hands-on mission experience to provide a meal and then also to fellowship. We are in need of tech volunteers for adult education. So please see the note in the bulletin on page 10 that um, this is something that we are in dire need of. And so those of you who have those kinds of skills, if you would be willing to donate up to, or volunteer up to maybe two hours a month, then please, um, please fill out the information form or contact uh, Carol Starr or myself for, for, for more information. We also are uh, recruiting facilitators or conversation leaders for our upcoming fall small groups, which will begin around September the 22nd so that we can get the full six weeks in prior to the end of October. So you don't have to have had previous experience and this isn't a heavy lift. It's not like teaching a class. It's really for an opportunity to fellowship with your fellow members as well as have an interesting discussion and we will be using uh, Howard Thurman's Jesus and the Disinherited as the resource for that uh, small group this fall. So again, if you're interested or just wants to ask some questions about becoming a facilitator for the fall small groups, please contact me. And then lastly, um, if you turn your attention to that uh, Elizabeth Bullock, who has been with us for almost two years, I think it is. And so she will be transitioning at the end of August um, to other opportunities. And so for those of you who would like to express your thanks, please, uh, in, in terms of um, notes of appreciation, um, please email them to Andrew Milne, or you could uh, put them in the box um, 
I don't want you to put them in Elizabeth's box, so maybe don't put them in the box yet. <laughs> if, if you put them in the box, you can put them in my box between now for the next couple of weeks, and then I'll figure it out next week. So if you have something that you'd like to say to her, you could put it in my box um, between now and, and, and the next two weeks. And then lastly, I call your attention to our, uh, um, let's see. Our cares and concerns or celebrations and concerns, which are found on page 12, and that will uh, allow you to, to peruse and to learn um, the celebrations and concerns that we are praying for within our congregation. And um, that is all for right now. Thank you. I invite you to join me in the prayer of adoration and confession, followed by a time of silence for your personal confessions. Holy One, we come before you with contrite hearts. We know what you've done and left undone. You know we've betrayed and excluded, yet you love us still. We do not mean to hurt or cause harm, yet we easily cover up our wrongs. We bow before you in hope and trust that you won't push us away, but will draw us home once more into the arms of your never failing love. Confessions, whether spoken aloud or acknowledged silently within our hearts, are pleasing to, to our God. Friends, believe the good news. All right, are you ready? Wait, where are my lips going? I lost my words. Hang on. All right, Katie Ledecky, Simone Biles, Kate Douglas, Coco Goff, Caleb Dressel, and Noah Lyles. Anybody know what those folks have in common? Anybody know who Simone Biles is? Who's Simone Biles? Anybody know? Who is Simone? Do you know who she is? Yeah. Who is she? Yeah. Yeah, she does gymnastics. This, okay, let me ask you a different question. Does anybody know what's happening in Paris right now? <laughs> what is it? The Olympics. The Olympics. So, those names I just named are all of some, or some of our top Olympics competing for the United States at the Olympics. So, I want to know, what does it take to get to the Olympics? What do you think it takes to get to the Olympics? What does it Airplane. take? Airplane! 
Oh. <laughs> right? They don't take an airplane to get to the Olympics. I couldn't have asked for a better answer. All right, let me rephrase that. <laughs> what does it take to become an Olympian athlete? What do you think it takes? Practice, absolutely. What else does it take, my friend? It takes a lot of courage and pride and hard work. You are absolutely right. It does take a lot of courage and hard work. What else does it take? A world record. A world record, you're right. What do you think, Andrew? Commitment. Commitment, what else? Practicing. Practicing, yes. And would you characterize all of these athletes as being weak or strong? Strong. Okay, so now let's focus on what it takes to get strong. Okay, anybody know? What is weightlifting? Yes, weightlifting. What else? Courage. Courage, yes. Workout. Working out. Exercise. Exercise. Yes, it does take time. It takes a lot of time. What else? What does Popeye eat um, to get strong? Chicken and dumplings. Chicken and dumplings. <laughs> Maybe. Vegetables. Yeah, vegetables. Popeye might be a reference that you all don't get. Do you know, Andrew, what does Popeye eat? Spinach. Spinach. Popeye eats spinach. You got to eat healthy foods. What if I told you that you all are just as strong, if not stronger, than those Olympic athletes? <gasps> what? What? How, how is that possible? Hang on. Thea, can you, Thea, do you think you could do like 200 push ups right now? Yes. What about? I can. Okay, what, Ella, do you think that you could, or Robin, do you think that you could lift 250 pounds? No. Deadlift. No, no, no. But I would die. But I'm telling you that you are stronger, as, as strong if not stronger than those Olympic athletes, even the ones that can lift 250 pounds and do 200 push-ups, and they can throw a shot put hundreds of yards and they can run and break rank world records. Yes, what's your question? How? Do you want to know how you're this strong? That'd be a really good question right now. Yeah? Okay, we want to know how. How are you this strong? Well, you have strength through the love of God. You have the question. Oh, what's your question? I think they do it with practice and hard work and all the things we talked about. But hold on to your hands for just a minute because I want to tell you something now. I want to tell you that God's love, Christ's love, gives us strength beyond what we could imagine. That we can do all kinds of incredible things that will change the world, just like those Olympic athletes, except we are doing it through the power of Christ. You should definitely eat your spinach, but you are strong already because of the love of God. Does anybody have any idea how big God's love is? How big is God's love? How big is it? Bigger than you think. The size of the earth. What do you think? Bigger than you think it can be. Yeah, there, there we go. All right, guys, go on home. That was the lesson for the day. It's bigger than we could think it'd be. What is it? Bigger than Jupiter. Bigger than all the planets smashed together. That's right, guys. You are so right. God's love is bigger than we can even imagine. And bigger than God's, the sun. Bigger than the sun. That's right. Through God's love, we are given the power of the Holy Spirit to go out and do things and to be strong. And that is incredible. So while you may never break a world record, I think you all have the possibility to. You already are as strong as an Olympic athlete. And you are given God's love, which is bigger than Jupiter and the sun and bigger than we could possibly imagine. And it allows us to dream big and to do big things and to change the world in really big ways. Okay? Let's pray. Let's pray. Dear God, Dear God. thank you for the love of Christ. Thank you for the love of Christ. That makes us stronger than Olympic athletes. And helps us change the world in huge ways.
Help us remember how strong we are. And help us to show your love to the world. In your son's name. Amen. All right, friends, it's time to head out to church school or back to your parents. Today's scripture lesson comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. Hear these words. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of God's glory, God may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through God's spirit and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be fulfilled with all the fullness of God. Now to God who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to God's power that is at work within us. To God be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There was a time when, other than to advertise for the sale of a house, yard signs were only displayed during election time. People planted signs in their front lawns to support their favorite candidate or a particular proposition. In more recent years, though, more and more signs are displayed to share a list of a homeowner's views on trending social issues. For example, and then most of these signs um, begin with the heading, we believe. So the signs, one sign that I saw says, water is life, hate has no home here, diversity makes us stronger, science is real, no human is illegal. Another sign says, black lives matter, women's rights are human rights, love is love, no human is illegal, Science is real. Kindness is everything. And then there was this yard sign that said, yard signs are stupid. Your activism is performative. These signs are just virtue signaling. Policy is greater than platitudes. Boiling your beliefs down to a few sentences is bad. These signs are ugly anyway. Now perhaps we might consider that the first century letter to the church of Ephesus is the equivalent of our 21st, lawn, 21st century lawn sign. In the scripture that Michelle read, the author of Ephesians shares a prayer or a blessing for his hope for their faith walk and new identity in Christ. He doesn't share a set of beliefs but rather possibilities for their lives to be transformed by the indwelling of Christ in their hearts. Please pray with me. Creator God, Father of your whole family on earth and in heaven, we kneel before you this morning in spirit, if not in body. We thank you for the incarnation of Jesus who lived among us. Now let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. 
O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. And may your gathered people see more of you and less of me. Amen. Now our scripture lesson for today comes from the letter of Ephesians, as Michelle said. And unlike any of Paul's other letters, it was not written for a specific problem and it didn't address a major crisis in the community. Rather, it was written to offer encouragement and to strengthen the community. The letter was written to guide the behavior of both Gentiles and Jews as they took on their new identity in Christ. Friends, when we give our life to Christ and try to walk in faith, God is always with us as promised, but it is not always easy. The author of Ephesians offers this prayer to the community, a blessing for these believers. He petitions God for three things on their behalf. First, he prays that God strengthen them with power through God's spirit in their inner being so that Christ may dwell in their hearts through faith. Now we hear about this indwelling of Christ. We, it's something that we hear all the time. So this author of Ephesians is not praying for physical strength, as Rosanna was talking with the children about, not physical strength for their body or for things in the material world. His prayer is that Jesus come to reside in their hearts, not on a temporary basis, but on a permanent basis. He prays that God completely transform their hearts, that that place that governs their moral nature, their reason and their mind and their will, the hub or control center of their personal being, be one that will be under Jesus' guidance. The writer of Ephesians doesn't pray that they become Christians. His readers are already part of the church of Jesus' followers. Instead, his prayer is that God grant them more and more inner spiritual strength, which comes from yielding to God, Christ's guidance within so that they become more spiritually minded. We know that there is a battle for our hearts and minds since the Garden of Eden. You know, we're familiar with the phrase, you know, what, has the devil, what, what the devil has gotten into you when you do something sort of odd or weird. And there were these cartoons for a long time. It might, it might be sort of like, uh, what does Popeye eat? Um, this particular reference. But there used to be, you know, in cartoons um, and particular characters, when they needed to make a decision about right and wrong, there'd be a devil sitting on one shoulder and an angel sitting on another shoulder. And that was to kind of reflect their conscience in terms of deciding how to make a decision to do the right thing. Even Paul says that although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. So this ability to do good and to resist evil emanates from the indwelling of Christ. The ability to bless and not curse those who persecute us emanates from this indwelling of Christ. The indwelling of Christ allows us to feed our enemy when he is hungry and to give them something to drink if they are thirsty. And according to the Gospel of Michelle Obama, if they go low, then we go high. And how does this increase in spiritual strength occur? It occurs through faith. And that's something that we don't really talk about a lot, and sometimes people are even uncomfortable even using the word faith. So for those of you who faith kind of is a heavy burden for you to talk about it in that sense, it's, it's it's our trust, it's our absolute trust in and loyalty to the God that comes about through prayer and other spiritual practices that draw us closer to God. So just like the children were learning that in order to be an Olympic champion, you have to do practice, we as Christians oftentimes forget that our spiritual well-being is just as important as those things that we are doing for the sake of Christ. And that spiritual well-being comes about through our own diligence and our consistency with our practices like prayer or maybe even walking for some of you that that calms you or puts you in touch with God. For some of us, it's, it's observing nature in some kind of way. 
So in practice of centering prayer, we say that we surrender to the presence of God and God's action in our lives. And so it's not something that we're going to necessarily feel at a particular time. What happens when we're making strides or improvements in our spiritual path is that other people notice it, that they notice that you're a little calmer. They notice that you're not as uh, reactive about certain things that are either said or done. So again, we submit or surrender to God's presence during prayer or other spiritual practice, but we're also surrendering to the action or the power of God within us in our lives. When Christ dwells in our hearts, Christ is more effective in guiding our actions and we can show others the love of Christ. Now, first, the author of Ephesians prays that God strengthen them with power through God's Spirit in their inner being so that, they, that Christ might dwell in their hearts through faith. Secondly, he prays that rooted and grounded in love, that they may grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. So it's almost one of those conundrum things. I mean, it's like we're, we're told to grasp it so that we can understand the knowledge or have knowledge of that, but it's something that we can't have knowledge of because it's so wide that we can't get around it, it's so high that we can't get over it, it's so deep that we can't go under it, that there's no way to measure this concept that he's talking about but it lets us know that it's, it's, it's enormous, that it encompasses, it just encompasses everything and that there's nothing that will surpass it. Now the Greek word translated as grasp literally means to seize tight or hold on to. Now while the third definition for this verb is, is I perceive or I comprehend, the use of grasp, when they say, when the author says he wants you to grasp how abundant or how grasp how wide the love of Christ is, it demonstrates that there has to be an intention on our part, that there's intentional effort, and that basically, um, that in the grasping, that we have to do some action. It's not that it just is we think about it, that in grasping that there's um, this, this really dramatic movement on our part. The author implies as much when he says that Christ's love surpasses knowledge. He prays that they can comprehend the vastness of Christ's love. So I, I think about grasp when if, you know, again, another, mm, another thing that might be sort of um, out of some people's memory bank, but, you know, we talk about the metaphor of the brass ring. So my experience with the brass ring was when, um, was when we went to our annual church picnic that there was a merry-go-round. And so one year they put in this brass ring machine. And it took me a while to figure out what it was because it was this metal stand and as it went around and it's, there was a sign that said, you know, get the brass ring, one free ride. And so, you know, I'm looking for the brass ring. And it took a while until my brother explained to me that it fell down, it was very random, it fell down into this little slot. And while you're on the merry-go-round, you had to reach over and grab it, you know, as the merry-go-round went around. And so, um, you know, after a couple of times of practicing and being very diligent, I was able to get the brass ring, and, and then that was entitled me to a free, um, a free merry-go-round ride. So I understand every time I hear the word grasp, I think about how random it could be, you know, but that it takes intention, it takes the knowledge of how the machine works, it takes, it, uh, it takes, you, you have to be able to strategize whether you're on the outside of the merry-go-round, right? If you're sitting on an inside horse or you're sitting in one of those seats, that's not gonna be helpful because you're not gonna be able to get to it close enough. And you have to be ready so that as you know that you're passing every time that you're gonna be able to reach out and grasp the ring. 
Now, I, I wanted to share that, um, that my youngest son, Benjamin, is 10 years younger than his older sister. And he was eight when his sister graduated from high school and didn't know um, that his grandmother had said that when she graduated, that was his la her last graduation. It was her third graduation and she, was, she felt like, I'm just getting too old. She didn't like crowds and she had a hard time climbing the bleachers. And she hated having to wait until, the, you know, the long line of, you know, sometimes there were 500 kids in each class. And so, and if her grandchildren were sort of at the middle to the end, it could take a long time for their name to get called to receive their diploma. So she had said this and 10 years passed and it was time for Benjamin to graduate. And at the beginning of his senior year, I explained to him that grandma loved him dearly and was really proud of him, but that she just didn't do graduations anymore. So Benjamin said that he understood that and that was the end of it for what I thought until a couple of weeks before the graduation when grandma called to find out what time was the graduation. And the only explanation she offered was, well, I couldn't very well miss Benjamin's graduation. So the author's prayer is that we don't just intellectually know about Christ's love, but that we really get it, that we grasp it in our inner being, that it will be something like how Benjamin really got how much his grandmother loved him when she came to his graduation. The other thing about Christ's love is that we cannot grasp it in isolation. So you're always hearing us talking about community and doing things in community, opportunities for connection. It's because we get it from our interactions with other members of the body of Christ. The love of Christ that we share with one another is the characteristic that extends to every part of the life of the church. It's what distinguishes us from others. It's what's meant when we say that they will know we are Christians by our love. Lastly, the author prays that we may be filled or that they may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And the author of Ephesians has all these um, prepositional phrases in the way that he words things. And so, you know, you kind of wonder now, does this clause go with this? And, and so this idea of what is the fullness of God? And so we know that God is love. And so to, to, be, to have the fullness of God within us is to have God's love in us, to be filled, that, that it's like God opens you up and pours some of his love in you, and that you're filled up to the top, you're filled up to the full measure that you can receive of God's love. It's the love of God which God self-possesses, and it's this love that God shares with God's people. God fills us individually so that we can live a lifestyle consistent with our Christian identity in Christ, and so that when we gather as the corporate body of Christ, we can share this love with the world. Now the author prays that the believers at Ephesus be strengthened so Christ can dwell in their hearts on a permanent basis. He prays that they grasp the extent of Christ's love so that they can be filled with God's love, so that they can live like God desires for us to live and to love like God loves us. Now James, uh, the brother of Jesus in his book, in the Gospel, says that we do not have because we do not ask. And then Jesus tells us to ask and it shall be given. And God says, I will let you find me when you search for me with your whole heart. Now, every Sunday for the last few months, actually, we, we read um, in the bulletin um, when, when the presider, you know, either David or myself, say, we gather in this holy pace, the congregation's response is that we might know and understand God better. And so I, 
I challenge you that when you hear that now, that you think about these words, about the prayer from this author of the Ephesians, that to know and to understand God better, that we want to know God better, that we want to grasp and understand the love of Christ. We want to be filled up with the fullness of God so that we may be strengthened by the power of God's Spirit so that Jesus can dwell in our hearts. And that, that dwelling, that inner dwelling on a permanent, consistent basis over time allows us to grow. It's not that we get a one-time feeling, it's that we, we continue to grow and that we may grasp the vastness of Christ's love for us so that we may be filled to the fullness of God's love to live the life that God wants us to live, that we've been called to live. So friends, this is possible. This is possible, why? Because God is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or even imagine according to God's power that is at work within us. And so we say to God, be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And before I close, I just want to give you kind of an update on Grandma attending the graduation. So she came, and to show you, you know, I always give credit to the Holy Spirit. I'm sorry. I just, you know, this, this is my favorite Bible verse, that God can do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. And so Benjamin, after 10 years, 10 years from Miriam's graduation to Benjamin's, the school changed how they did the graduation. So we got there early. Grandma got a great seat, and she was, she was okay. She was prepared to hunker down, and, and they had a surprise for her. The children marched in first, that they marched in, and their names were called, and they got the diplomas the very first thing. So within 20 minutes of the service, Benjamin's name had been called. He had seen his grandmother there and waved to her, and she waved to him. And as soon as he was finished, you know, getting his diploma and sitting back down, grandma was able to leave. So I just, you know, I just, I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, it was one of those things I was like, you know, um, somebody must have known you really needed that mom. And so, again, I just say, God is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or even imagine. I could not have imagined that happening according to God's power at work within us. To God be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations. Amen.
invite you to join me in the response in faith in your bulletin. God's redeeming work in Jesus Christ embraces the whole of life, social and cultural, economic and political, scientific and technological, individual and corporate. It includes the natural environment as exploited and spoiled by sin. It is the will of God whose pur purpose in life shall be fulfilled under the rule of Christ and all evil be banished from God's creation. Although God's reign is present as a permanent in the world, stirring hope and preparing the world to receive his ultimate judgment and redemption. With an urgency born of this hope, the church applies itself to present tasks and strives for a better world. It does not identify limited progress with the kingdom of God on earth in the face of disappointment and defeat. It is steadfast hope that the church looks beyond all that she and she the power at work able to do far more abundantly than we ask or think. To God's glory in the church and the Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. God's grace is abundant. Wherever we wander, God remains our God. The profoundness of God's love stands in contrast of the harsh judgment of our world. In response to his unfailing love, let us share our time, talent, and treasures to serve the ministries to which we are called. The ushers, please come forward.
Please join me in prayer. Gracious and holy God, indeed we do come to this place to get to know you better, to understand you better so that we might challenge ourselves to live how you would have us to live. And so we thank you for the model of Jesus Christ who came and dwelt among us, that having lived among us and given us guidance, we now allow him and we invite him to indwell in our hearts to continue that guidance that allows us to live the life that you call us to live as your followers, to love as Jesus commanded at the Last Supper, to, to love one another as he had loved his disciples, as he and you continue to love us this day. We thank you for the many blessings. We thank you for the blessings of the season. We thank you for opportunities to travel. We thank you for opportunities to fellowship with one another, the longer days. And so Lord, we know that even while we have joys, that there are concerns within the world, there are places of war that have gone on for years. So we ask that you be with those people who are suffering, who are the innocent victims of the fighting that goes on in Gaza, Israel, Myanmar, Taiwan, Ethiopia, Sudan, Uganda, Ukraine, and Russia, and many more places that we have not named. We ask blessings for the congregation that last week was desecrated, uh, vandalized, for expressing their love of all your children in their community. And so we pray that instances of this type of violence, this type of hate crime, this type of intolerance would no longer be a part of our community. And so we pray for those who are traveling, those who are traveling locally. And Lord, we ask a special prayer for families that are moving abroad that um, will be experiencing new cultures and new opportunities, and so that we send our love and our prayers with them and ask that you continue to hold them in your care to provide and shield them and protect them while they are away from us. And so we also are mindful of those in our congregation who are in need of prayer for illness, those who are either recovering from surgery or awaiting surgery, those who are isolated from the community, those who have contracted COVID, since it is on the uprise that people are being more careful, but we pray for those who are now recovering from COVID. And so we ask that um, prayers for all of those that we have named aloud or for those um, that we name in our hearts at this time. Lord, hear our prayers. So Lord, blessings on Becky and Robbie and Nick. Continued healing for Mike. Blessings for well-being for Dick and Jean. Blessings for health and well-being for Don. 
for Judy, Helen and her daughter, and Randy and Eric. And we ask all these things in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we go, this, you know, to, we gather in this place to know and to understand God better. And so we try to look at instances of where we have seen where we really got the love of God in our lives. That, um, that there are instances, and, and maybe if you don't readily recall one, a friend has shared with you a place where they really got it. So my charge to you today, two things. One, in keeping with what we've talked about today, one is to go home and for a few minutes just sit and think about where you have really got that somebody in your personal life really loved you, that, that there was something that happened, something they did, something they said, something that just happened, that you really got that, that that person in your life really loved you. And so I think when we do that, 
then it allows us to go a step further and to continue to sit and to ask God to help us to recall an instance of time when we really got, we really got how the love of Christ is in our life, how God really loves us individually. Those are just two things that I ask you to do. As we remember that, um, that that God is the one who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ask or even imagine according to that God's power that indwells in us. And so we say, glory be to God in the church and in Christ Jesus. Amen. And now may the love of that God and may the grace of Christ and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and all days. And all God's people say, Amen.
who are at home um, and to all of you here in the congregation. Um, one last thing, we've got 100 days, and so we've got 100 days to show the love of Christ to everybody we see every day, everyone. May the peace of Christ be with you. Thank you. Peace of Christ be with you. I don't remember what I did. Oh, hi, Abby. How are you? Hi, Courtney. How are you feeling? You feeling better? Okay, well, that's good. I just, uh, I know it's not fun being sick, you know, and, and it, it just uh, um, feels like, am I ever going to be well again? Yeah. Okay, but you go.